So, uh, hello everyone. Um, it's good to, to see you all here and I'm very excited to be here. So, as uh, Bill said, I'm going to present today a slightly different uh, topic. It's actually it's out of comfort zone for eBPF. Uh, small introduction about myself. I'm Val from Tel Aviv, Israel, staff engineer at Datadog. Before that, I've been a CTO and a co-founder of uh, my own startup called Secret. And before that, I was doing some uh, security research, so anything about low level, I'm a big enthusiast about it. Uh, at Datadog, I'm working on a USM product, which stands for Universal Service Monitoring. And uh, USM provides visibility into your service health metrics uh, universally across uh, your entire stack. But this talk is not uh, about the product, but more about the underlying technology, eBPF. And I will try to show you in the next 25 minutes uh, some uh, blind spots of EBPF. And so, unfortunately, I won't be able to delve into all details of every uh, subject of the presentation because each one of them can be a separate presentation on its own. Uh, but instead, I'll try to show you a full picture and at the end uh, show the solution that I ended up implementing to solve the problem of uh, capturing encrypted TLS traffic of Java applications. And please don't throw rotten tomatoes at me for exposing the blind spots of uh, eBPF. Um, so let's begin from a 30,000 foot view and talk a bit very, very briefly about the general scope of cloud application monitoring. The goal here is to track performance, health, and availability of the applications running in the cloud environments. And one uh, popular approach, uh, which is widely uh, adopted, called RED method, was invented by Tom Wilkie while working at Google. Uh, so RED is the abbreviation which stands for uh, R for requests, R for er errors, and D for duration. So basically we are measuring the number of requests that uh, your service is handling. Uh, the portion of those requests that are errors allows you to know how your service is functioning and whether it's within your SLO. And then finally, the duration of time it takes uh, for each request to be handled by your service gives you an insight into the overall user experience of your application. So here we have a short uh, diagram uh, taken from a data platform that uh, illustrates uh, the red metrics. Um, so now let's begin gradually zooming in and uh, under to understand the actual problem before we are talking about any solutions. So this time is we will talk a bit about eBPF positioning and cloud application monitoring. And heads up, I'm not going to give any basic uh, introduction about eBPF. I'm assuming the audience here is uh, familiar with it. So um, eBPF is, has rapidly become a cornerstone uh, in the ecosystem of cloud application monitoring products and uh, it's marked by its versatility, minimal invasiveness, and negligible performance impact. So this positions eBPF as a comprehensive solution for modern cloud application monitoring, offering a unified approach for diver diverse monitoring needs, deployment that seamlessly integrates without disrupting existing operations, what I call zero touch, uh, and only marginal effect on the application performance, ensuring efficiency. At Datadog, we are utilizing eBPF in multiple products. Uh, one of them is USM that I mentioned before. That's the one that I'm uh, working on as well. Uh, so now we are narrowing the scope even further and let's have a very crash course about Java and JVM. So Java being a high, le high level language known as write once run anywhere, WARA, uh, that uh, allows uh, you for a developer to code without worrying about any specific operating system. The magic happens uh, because of the Java code is being compiled into intermediate bytecode, uh, which is a universal format, and then the Java virtual machine, which is the JVM, pr which presents on most system, uh, translates this bytecode into the native code that is being executed on your, on, in your environment. JVM offers a few uh, key features. Uh, one of them is just-in-time compilation to speed up and optimize the performance of the application. Finally, JVM also performs automatic memory management, which is also known as garbage collection, to free up and use memory, making development smoother and prone to nasty memory corruption bugs. 
So let's uh, focus for a second on a few important aspects that we will see in the following slides uh, that will be crucial and impact uh, our straightforward approach with VPF to handle Java applications. Uh, the highlighted properties of JVM will become a major uh, blocker for the straightforward solution, as I said. So first of all is the optimization mechanism used by JIT and the fact that the final native code is dynamically created and modified during the lifetime of the application. And to add on top of that, there is also a built-in memory management of JVM that controls the memory layer to the target application, which adds a dynamic property to it. Okay, now we have uh, enough background and uh, we can start assembling the pieces of the puzzle to understand the, that the problem exists. So let's uh, start with a very simpler use case than the problem we will be talking about soon. Let's start with the plain traffic coming from a Java application. And this is the area where eBPF is actually excels uh, because uh, we can utilize uh, K probes uh, that are agnostic to the target application uh, programming language. And uh, we are hooking uh, the traffic from the kernel side and we are able to capture those payloads. Small disclaimer, in TSM we are using socket filters, but for the sake of this presentation, it doesn't really matter whether K-probes or socket filters. Actually, in the reality, this approach works pretty well in uh, customer environments because a lot of times the TLS uploading is happening at the load balancer on the gateway level and inter uh, cluster communication between the microservices is actually plain traffic. So uh, now let's look on a slightly different use case. Uh, here we are talking about TLS communication, but from a Python application. So the inclusion of Python is not uh, by mistake. It's actually to emphasize the real problem of uh, Java and the uniqueness of uh, this use case. Um, so let, let, let's start. Yeah, there are a lot of arrows, so let's, uh, I'll try to break down this diagram. Um, let's start with a previous approach. If we are trying to use K-probes, those will not work because uh, the TLS traffic is already encrypted on the kernel side. Uh, fortunately for us, uh, Python is using a native library, OpenSSL, uh, to encrypt and decrypt the traffic. And uh, eBPF deals with it relatively easy using the uProbes mechanism, which basically user mode hooks on exported symbols. Uh, I, I mentioned relatively because uh, it's also a bit devious from the approach one solution to rule them all, since uh, we need to support each one of those uh, user mode libraries uh, uh, independently. For example, OpenSSL, GNU TLS, Boring SSL, and et cetera, et cetera. But again, this is also not the scope for this uh, presentation. So now we are moving to the actual problem. So now we are facing TLS traffic originating from Java application. And here, eBPF is uh, actually powerless when we are taking the straightforward approach. So let's understand why. As mentioned, there is the Python case. K-probes won't help us here. The traffic is encrypted. Unfortunately, we cannot set up the uProbes because uh, the uh, aspects of uh, JVM and the fact that the bytecode being dynamically translated into the native code which prevents us from having exported symbols and fixed offsets to set up the uprops in the beginning. So now we have ourselves a problem. And uh, we are trying, just to clarify the problem, we are trying to get red metrics that I mentioned before from a Java application that are using TLS encrypted uh, traffic uh, as a communication. And uh, to add on top of that problem, let's add a few more requirements that uh, we want to match when we are trying to develop a solution. Uh, so similar to general requirements of the USM product, we want to be non-disruptive and have a zero touch deployment. So basically we don't want our customers to ask making any changes to their application or redeploy them. Uh, obviously we want to support different flavors of different uh, HTTP libraries written in Java and also different Java versions. Um, and lastly, we want to be uh, able to run on containerized and non-containerized environments and uh, hopefully also have a minimal resource usage, resource usage overhead. 
so to begin with, I'll present here a slide that will uh, show a pseudocode for the full solution, and then uh, I'll dive into each one of the steps uh, in the following slides. So full solution will contain four different steps. The first step will be detection, that we want to detect the target application, Java application, that we need to uh, capture its TLS traffic. Then we will have the injection phase, and uh, in, in this phase we will inject a Java agent, which we will talk uh, in a few minutes about it, that will allow us to uh, capture the traffic. How we are going to do that? By using instrumentation a technique, which is a mechanism that is built in in Java in order to instrument the target classes and uh, uh, capture the plain payload just before the encryption of the ingress traffic and just after the decryption of the egress. And finally, once we have this payload in our hands inside the target Java application, we would want to extract it somehow into our existing pipeline to the USM uh, product for further processing. Uh, all parts of this solution are fully open sourced. Uh, on the next slides, I left some links for uh, code in, in our GitHub, so you can see. So uh, let's start with the first step, which is detection. I will not uh, dive too much into the details. Basically, we have an existing component in ESM called Process Watcher that allows us to detect uh, processes based on some uh, attributes. We are reusing this component for our solution here, but we are also using it for other use cases, for example, to detect Go applications and uh, deploy uprobs on Go TLS. Once the target application is detected, now we want to do the injection phase. So the injection phase is actually a unique phase for Java TLS problem, uh, for other uh, languages or uh, other uh, like plain traffic, we could reuse k-probs or u-probs as I mentioned before. But here we want, we need to implement an injector and uh, that's, uh, uh, that injector is part of, uh, of our product. And once we have the injector, we also need some payload that we want to inject. So uh, naturally we need to embed some uh, Java agent, a jar file inside the, of uh, our uh, datadog agent. For the uh, payload, and I will explain a bit in, in a bit details later, we are going to reuse our own uh, DD Java tracer, which is also open sourced, and we are going to extend it a little bit for with the functionality that we need to capture TLS traffic. So let's talk a little bit about injection. Uh, so Java has a built-in mechanism allowing injection of the agent into a running Java application. This is called dynamic attach. And it allows, among other options, to inject a package jar into a running Java application. So uh, the Java, those Java agents can be actually dynamically attached or statically attached upon target application startup via a special command flag. And dynamic attach, basically how it works, there is a listener thread in the target uh, JVM uh, and we trigger this thread by uh, creating a special file with a specific name, dot attach uh, underscore PID, and the PID of, the, of our process. And then we send a sequit uh, signal to the target application. On the GVM side, we have a handler for this uh, signal that uh, captures the signal and then establish a communication channel. On Linux, it happens over a Unix socket. And then over that socket, we have a proprietary protocol to perform different operations from our injector to that uh, target application. Um, there's an open source utility called JAttach that implements a simple injector, which supports, supports also a containerized environments that does like namespace switching. Uh, it's written in C, so what we, what we did uh, uh, in our solution, we actually ported the solution to Go since uh, our agent and the user space is written in Go. And uh, fortunately, this functionality of dynamic injection is allowed by default for Java applications with a small asterisk, so it's true until uh, Java version 21. And then from Java version 21, it's, the flag was flipped and it's disabled now by default. 
Uh, once our agent is injected, uh, now we can start instrumenting the target application classes and modify their behavior in runtime. So in the next two slides, we will go over the basics of Java instrumentation and dive a bit into the particular targets that we want to instrument for our use case. Uh, reminder, we are trying to capture TLS traffic here. So let's do a crash course in the Java instrumentation. Uh, any Java agent must have a special two entry points, pre-main and agent main. So pre-main is used for static uh, uh, injection and startup, and agent main is used via dynamic injection. That's our use case here. Uh, in our case, we want to capture plane buffers. As I said just before, those requests are encrypted, and just after the responses are received and decrypted. Uh, so, uh, in order to perform this instrumentation, we, there are a few options, like there's a built-in option in JDK, uh, and there's a library called ASM, which operates on the bytecode level and allows us to do instrumentation of Java classes that already compiled into bytecode. Uh, this is too low-level Java for us, so uh, instead of that, uh, we are using a, another open-source framework called ByteBuddy which is a basically a wrapper, a high-level wrapper that allows us to operate on the Java uh, source code level and under the hood it is using USM. And by the way, uh, in a very uh, brief, contains like three major components. Uh, so they are matchers. Matchers are meant to find the target Java classes that we want to instrument. There are advices, those are the snippets that we write in Java and this is the code that we want to execute uh, once the target classes are instrument, uh, instrumented to execute our custom uh, behavior. And there are transformers, those are, those are in charge of transforming the target class to include our advices. And ByteBuddy also provides uh, rich annotation capabilities that allow us to execute those advices in different uh, uh, times of the uh, target application execution. For example, on method enter or on method exit. Uh, plus it gives us a direct access to different uh, variables and arguments of the uh, target function like a return value or this pointer which is the current class pointer in Java and more. Uh, so uh, now let's let's talk a little bit about what are, what do we want to actually instrument. Uh, so on the Java side, there are a lot of different implementations for different uh, HTTP uh, web frameworks and uh, uh, network frameworks. Just taken from our own documentation, this is just a sub list of different frameworks that today uh, the tracer supports. Uh, but as I mentioned before, one of our goals is try to minimize the, uh, the solution and have a, like sort of like one hook to rule them all. So instead of targeting the application layer, we want to go uh, on the network stack a bit uh, down and go for a session and presentation layer. And uh, here I have a small diagram just to illustrate the solution. So there are different uh, frameworks like Apache Client, OKHttp, OK and a few others, but they are all using the same uh, libraries under the hood. Uh, so they basically classify into two different groups. There are synchronous communication and asynchronous communication. For the simplicity, uh, in this demonstration, I will be talking about synchronous present, uh, communication. And uh, in this case, uh, all those frameworks are using SSL socket, uh, which is part of the JDK, Java base uh, module. But the asynchronous uh, case can be handled in a, in a similar manner with just a few extra caveats of asynchronous uh, programs. Yeah, this one. Uh, so now uh, let's show some example of the advice, like what is the instrumentation, how does it look like? As we saw in the previous slide, we want to target the SSL socket, but SSL socket is actually an abstract class and there are different uh, implementations of this class. So uh, our matcher uh, will look something like that. We are targeting uh, SSL socket uh, der derives, which are concrete classes. And then uh, our 
transformer will look uh, like that, that we want to target specific methods of this target class. So in this case, the SSL socket uh, implements some stream uh, interface in order to read and write into the socket. And there's also a close method in order to close the socket and terminate the connection. So we want to instrument those in order to uh, apply our proxy and uh, capture the traffic which while it's still playing. So lastly, that's how the, our advice will look like. So for example, uh, here we are instrumenting the get output stream function of the SSL socket class and we are uh, replacing the return value. Uh, again, like take a look uh, on the annotations provided by ByteBuddy. We are replacing it with uh, our own implementation, so basically <coughs> installing a proxy in the middle. And finally, once uh, we manage to capture the traffic, so we, we want uh, to extract this traffic into our uh, pipeline, which is in a separate process or a separate container, depends on the environment. Uh, so we do that, so in order to do that, we need to implement sort of inter-process communication protocol. Uh, and for that, uh, we have uh, our own implementation, what we call ERPC. ERPC is like for inter-process communication over ABPF. Um, actually, the solution is very simple, but that's what makes it also very elegant. Basically, we have a handler on the, uh, in, on, in our uh, ABPF side that we are setting up a K-probe on a Yoctel uh, syscall. And uh, we are filtering out uh, only the Yoctos with a specific code. And then uh, on the target application side, in, the, in our case is the target Java, we are just uh, firing this uh, Yocto with the payloads. Uh, and that actually works in uh, any environment, whether our containers or nodes, since our agent is running on that, on that host uh, in a privileged container. Um, so now it's a uh, live demo time. I will start with running an agent. This is our USM product. And let me show here. So we run here uh, the agent and we are going to execute a Java client that will just send uh, HTTPS uh, get commands to http.org slash UUID every second. And for some reason, that doesn't work. Let's try it again. Hmm. Okay. Um, okay, so for, for this case, I have a pre-recorded demo. So yeah, I'm going to do the same thing, but just now I'm just talking and not typing anything. So we are running an agent here uh, with a config flag enabled for Java TLS monitoring, as I highlight here. Then uh, what we are going to do, we are going to do a serial to some debug uh, Unix socket to see the payloads that we capture, but now we didn't see anything. Now we're going to run the client, which will send the request to HTTP bin slash UUID every second. And now we are going to, 
to, try to send CRL again to that socket and we will see the payloads. So I think that will be it. Uh, so, any questions? Yes, so we have time for one question, if anybody has it, has one. Do you have a plan for after um, Java 21, I think it was? Um, there's a yes and there's a no. <laughs> so we do have some uh, plans that we want to explore, but we don't have a solution that will uh, for sure work. Um, my, our main plan is actually to integrate our work with uh, another product of uh, Datadog called APM that are working now on uh, doing also uh, sort of like dynamic uh, injection support for uh, Java applications. We have a bit different uh, method, uh, but uh, it's like a, for a long-term roadmap. All right, thanks. All right, great, thank you, Val. Thank you.